So, your highnesses, excellencies, and uh, people of uh, Saud as well. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Philip Tor, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, robustness and fragility of deep networks. And uh, what I'll do first is tell you a little bit about myself um, to show why my journey of why I think this is important. Um, I'm also very excited to be in Saudi Arabia. I'm a professor at Oxford. Lawrence of Arabia is at Oxford, so after I uh, visit here, I plan to um, drive around your beautiful country, go to Alulula and then down to Jeddah. So I'm very excited to uh, be here for the first time. Um, so I uh, did my PhD at Oxford, and uh, in the very early days, in the 90s, I worked at Microsoft Research, and then I've worked for about 30 years, and I've seen the field be transformed. And when I worked at Microsoft, it was almost uh, incredible to think now, there were just hardly any applications of, um, of machine learning. Um, and now, um, as time has passed, I'm a professor at Oxford, and I'm involved in numerous uh, spin-outs. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you um, so uh, a little bit about my group. So. Um, my uh, first uh, passion was computer vision. So this is um, trying to make machines see. So it would involve things like uh, 3D reconstruction, recognition, um, um, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of applications that might be explaining an image in some way. Um, and we've got a host of collaborators, so I work with all the big tech companies and uh, we actually won awards in every computer vision conference, every major computer vision conference. So anyway, um, in order to understand why I got so interested in the fragility or robustness of deep networks, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the spin-outs that I've been involved in. So um, the first one was Oxite. And the aim of this was to make augmented uh, reality glasses to help the partially sighted achieve day-to-day um, -day objectives. So um, there are many, many people uh, who are partially sighted um, worldwide. Um, here are some uh, figures for them, 45 million of them. Um, and often they'll have uh, uh, some sight, um, oops, sorry some site uh, uh, degradation, but some um, remaining site. So we made uh, transparent displays that uh, will then um, give you uh, augmented information on those displays. Um, another company I'm involved in is, uh, is uh, again, using deep learning to work out people's sizes from mobile phones, from reconstruction, so that you can get fitted shirts. But probably the most related to what we're going to discuss is actually I worked, uh, um, uh, we had a, uh, a spin out called 5AI that worked on autonomous cars. And we did um, the first autonomous driving uh, taxi service in the city of London. Um, and actually, I found this working with autonomous cars, for me, working in computer vision, was uh, amazing because I was seeing ideas which um, were in research now being translated into reality. But it's very important when you do some um, safety critical uh, applications uh, like autonomous cars to actually make sure there are no bugs to get it right because the consequences will be um, the consequences of failure will be massive uh, uh, potential deaths um, and you know setting the field back and actually this is uh, uh, brought across by um, a recent report by the Royal Society that said that we need more tools to understand the robustness of AI to understand uh, to be able to verify them because we really don't understand what's going on and I'm going to give you some examples of some kind of slightly worrying things you know we think AI has progressed a long way we think it can solve everything but actually um, there are some very worrying things. So one was um, Tencent put some markers on the road and were able to make um, the Tesla autopilot self-parking veer off the road because uh, just these few uh, small patterns on the road uh, started to confuse it. Um, even worse than that, 
you could take an image. So in computer vision in which I work, you could take an image like a pig, um, and you could uh, add some um, just very small imperceptible noise. So this is the image here with the imperceptible noise added. And now the deep uh, network thinks it's an airliner. So for us, it looks exactly the same. But just adding a very small noise pattern, you've immediately changed what the uh, prediction of the deep network is. Um, and uh, this is for many different types of classifiers. So here, uh, we have a classifier which is uh, segmenting or breaking up, recognizing the road, the cars. We just add a tiny bit of noise. So these two images look the same. They just got a tiny bit of noise. The classifier goes crazy, and every bit of the image is misclassified, and it becomes uh, nonsense. Um, and you can even design universal patterns which you can add to the image, make these uh, two images uh, uh, totally indistinguishable. And for nearly any classifier, you can cause this catastrophic failure. So I think this is kind of an important thing, because it was discovered in computer vision. But as we um, start to uh, use deep networks for classification and decision making in ever higher dimensional data, the fact that um, Things which uh, you know, seem um, imperceptibly different to a human might have great instability in the deep network. Seems like problematic. Um, it's not just uh, imperceptible perturbations. So for instance, in vision, if you rotate things, you can find certain rotations that will flip the classification. Um, or if you change the color schemes, again, you might be able to flip the classification. Um, so uh, you know, this is a, a fundamental problem. Um, so one, one uh, direction of research we're uh, engaged in is actually trying to also quantify the uncertainty a neural network has. Because it should be able to tell you not just um, the classification, but also what the certainty associated with it is. Um, and I just wanted to mention we've got a, a joint, uh, we started working, so Oxford and uh, Coast have started working together with uh, Bernard Gainham, uh, Mohamed Azoni. And uh, this was uh, partly inspired by a postdoc who came from Coast to Oxford at LBB. So um, actually, after this uh, meeting, I'm going to go to Coast, and we've got a kickoff meeting for, um, for our uh, joint collaboration, which I'm very excited about. Um, so we've got this problem with robustness. Uh, but there's also a kind of related problem um, to this robustness. So some people might say, well, these um, deep networks are not robust because they haven't got uh, enough data, or, or maybe there's spurious correlations in the data. We might be able to get more data and be able to solve this. So I just put up some um, uh, facts and figures here about how much data is being created. And we're, as I think somebody else said, we're actually drowning in data at the moment. Um, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, every day, 306 billion emails uh, are sent. There'll be, um, you know, zettabytes of data in cloud storage in 2025. Okay, so this sounds great, but the problem is that the algorithms can't catch up because this is too much data for us to be able to just constantly retrain on because it's arriving at such a rate that um, uh, we also have a problem with how to even develop the algorithms to deal with this data. So. Um, that also leads to, uh, again, things we're working with in KAUST, which is how do we, can we train models that can take all of this new data, so we might get new tweets about COVID, but not forget the old data, but not have to use everything to train again. And that's called continual or incremental learning. So again, it's another uh, hugely important topic, I think, as um, the amount of data we've got expands. Uh, so. Um, this will be continual learning both for unsupervised and supervised models. So um, uh, again, that's some of the work that we're doing with people here. So exactly, uh, I had 10 minutes, and I think I finished on time. So I just wanted to highlight the uh, uh, three things which I think don't trust deep networks too much yet. Although you see all this amazing progress, actually, um, it's possible to fool them. And actually, it's possible to fool them in ways which um, we would find very alarming. So still, we need to exercise caution. And we need them to be able to tell us uh, how uncertain they are um, accurately. And uh, we also, um, in relation to this, uh, need to be able to um, start to think about new methods that will uh, deal with this 
uh, fire hose of data that's constantly coming. And uh, with that, I'd really like to thank you for your attention and for inviting me.